And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is George Lizos, author, spiritual teacher, Greek pagan priest, and the creator of the Intuition Mastery School. Today, we're going to be talking about the secrets of manifestation and more. George, thanks for joining me and welcome. Jeff, thank you so much for having me. Well, George, we are excited to have you, and especially we are excited to talk about manifesting. But before we get into it, can we start with your own spiritual journey and how you got into all this stuff? Yeah, of course. Long story, but I'll keep it short. It all started when I was 15 years old. So growing up in Cyprus, which is a very like small Mediterranean island at a time when homosexuality was actually illegal while I was growing up for the like a short part of my childhood. And I always felt like I was different. I always felt like I didn't fit in. So from a very young age, I was the kind of kid that, well, kids would go to like parties and play in the playground. And I would be out in nature by myself, like talking to flowers, staring about the sky and wondering what the purpose of life was. And as a result, that created this need of, I have to constantly change myself to fit in, to try and be what other people want me to be. I always felt like an outcast, like I was different. Fast forward to when I was 13 years old, that I realized I was gay in a world that did not accept that. And I already had a bunch of other like, um, like titles and labels of me, like you're the weird one, you, you like like strange things. I, I wouldn't take on yet another label, especially a label that at the time was attached to being a criminal or being a pedophile or something like that, or being like um, an abomination. So I decided to do what I did best, to change myself from gay to straight one step at a time. And that's essentially when I started my spiritual path, because for two years, I tried to change who I was born to be. I was monitoring the way I walked. I was monitoring the way I talked. I was monitoring my thoughts even to the point that I reached such a low psychological point that I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't change who I was born to be. That I'm like, what is the point of being in the world? And I decided to take my own life. And that was when I was 15 years old. And it was a very dark moment in my life. I was I had written a letter to my parents. I had a bunch of pills. I was getting ready to put an end to it. And that's when I had the epiphany. And the epiphany was, you know what? F what people think and what the church thinks and what society has to tell me. And just learn to accept yourself exactly as you are. And I had no idea how to love and accept myself because all I experienced was judgment and self-loathing. But in that moment, I opened myself up to receive help from the universe. I'm like, show me how to love myself. And that's when my first spiritual book came in my hands. <laughs> and it was a book about feng shui, of all things. So I used feng shui to change my, my house and my room and start experiencing positive change in my life. And from then on, the universe led me onto a path of different spiritual modalities, meditation, positive affirmations, manifestation. Uh, and I, I studied different spiritual traditions until eventually, uh, years later, I managed to love and accept myself and forgive my bullies and forgive, forgive myself and decided and felt this strong urge. How can I help people do the same? How can I help people take whatever it is that they're using to prevent themselves from being happy and teach them how to find all the love and the acceptance and the support they need within them rather than depending on external factors. And that's when I wrote my first book, Be the Guru, helping people become their own spiritual teachers, their own guru. And that led me onto a path of spiritual exploration that's reflected in all my books. Now, your newest book is called Manifestation Secrets, Working with the Seven Laws of the Universe to Manifest Your Life and Purpose. What are the seven laws of the universe? So ancient manifestation secrets, what I've done there is I've taken from the book, The Kibalion. Now, The Kibalion, when you... When, First, need to understand what the Kibalion is before we can talk about the seven laws of the universe. Because the Kibalion is not an ancient text, but it summarizes ancient hermetic principles. 
Hermeticism is a philosophical school and spiritual tradition from late antiquity that combined ancient Greek and ancient Egyptian philosophy. And therefore, it talked about how we can work with the universal laws to create our life, to create purpose, how essentially the universe works. And even though the Kibalion is not an ancient text, it summarizes those laws, but it doesn't go into applying the laws. It just tells you these are the laws of the universe. How do we apply them? So what I've done in ancient manifestation secrets is I'm talking about the laws, simplifying them so that people can understand them, but then also teaching how we can go about and, uh, and apply them. So let's talk about the universal laws. Firstly, we have the law of mentalism that says that the all is mind, the universe is mental. It's the idea that when we create something, it all starts with a mental thought, an intention, a mental image that we have. Then we have the law of correspondence that states that as above, so below, as below, so above. Talking about the three planes of existence, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual planes of existence where we, where we find different beings. We have humans, but we also have the gods and goddesses, spirit, spirit guides, ancestors, etc., that live in the different planes of existence. As above, so below, meaning the laws that exist in one plane can also exist in the other planes. From a manifestation perspective, that this means is that we can receive help from source, from spirit, from the gods and goddesses. And then we have the third law, the law of vibration, which we know as the law of attraction. It's one of the laws of manifestation that everybody's talking about, but there are way more laws than just the law of attraction. Now, the law of vibration teaches that nothing rests, everything moves, everything vibrates. And therefore, whatever we want to manifest has a vibrational frequency that when we match, we can bring and attract into our lives. Then the fourth law is the law of polarity saying that everything is dual, everything has poles, everything has its pair of opposites. It's the idea that whatever we are feeling and whatever state we have in our life, let's say, for example, we're poor or we're depressed, okay? Whatever it is that we are, whatever our current state is, we have access to its opposite because we're on this stick that has two poles and we're somewhere on the scale of the stick. And whatever point we are on this scale, we can move up the scale or down the scale to one pole or the other pole. And the poles are infinite and endless, meaning there is no limit to how happy we can be. And there is no limit to how fearful or depressed we can be because the poles are infinite. The fifth law is the law of rhythm, saying that everything flows out and in. Everything has its tides, all things rise and fall, meaning from these poles, there is this pendulum swing and life goes from one side to the other side, not all the way to the, to the end of the poles, but it goes in, in varying ways. We can see this with the economy. We go through a boom and then we go through a recession. We go through a period of peace and then we have wars. We have glaciers in the glacier period, period and then we go through a time where there is no ice age. So everything in life, including our own lives, goes through these, these, um, this tide and these um, pendulum-like swing. And then we have the sixth law, the law of cause and effect. That's most important when it comes to manifestation, saying that every cause has its effect. Every effect has its cause, meaning for, for every manifestation and therefore effect, there have been a series of causes that created that. One of those cause, causes is the vibrational frequency that we have that's shaped by our thoughts and emotions. But there are many other little known causes that not many people are talking about. And that was my aim with the book was to share those little known causes as well. And then we have the seventh law, the law of gender, saying that gender is in everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. It's the idea that there is masculine energy of taking action, moving forward, structure, and feminine energy, receiving, unstructured, flow, and both energies are needed to create something. And when you see physics, when you see how an atom is created, we have a negative ion, feminine energy, and a positive ion, masculine energy, coming together to create something. That's at the core of life and also manifestation. You mentioned that for different things you want to manifest, they have different frequencies. 
Can you give us some, some examples of certain frequencies that you need for certain outcomes of manifestation? Yes. So everything we are trying to manifest in our lives has a frequency in the sense that, let's say, for example, I want to manifest, I can't believe I'm going to use this example again. I keep using this example. It maybe it means something for, for me. I want to manifest a cruise in the Caribbean. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what I want to manifest. So let's say you want to manifest a cruise in the Caribbean. The frequency, the vibrational frequency of that cruise is the emotion you would feel if you were on that cruise. So if you think about, okay, right now I'm in that cruise in the Caribbean and you allow yourself to go there with your imagination and you identify that emotional signature, that feeling, the exact feeling of how you would feel on that ship while you're taking that cruise, that is a vibrational frequency of that desire. So it's the frequency of already having that desire. That's the best way to, to describe it. I call it the emotional signature. And when you embody that, you become a vibrational match to it, and therefore you activate the law of vibration, allowing you to bring that into your life. So that's a very simple example of how we can think about vibration. Is it just that simple? And if we use that example, like if we want to take a cruise, is that all we have to do is imagine being there and feel the emotion of being there? Or do we at least have to project the desire out into the universe or something else? So this is what most law of attraction and manifestation books are teaching, that that's all we need. Like my claim, and I expected to like ruffle some feathers when I wrote this in the book, I start the book by saying the law of attraction is not the most powerful law in the universe, which is what most people are teaching. And therefore the law of vibration is not the most powerful law in the universe because that's not the only thing we need there are other factors involved in manifestation. The law of cause and effect says that there are many causes that lead to an effect and therefore a manifestation, not just one cause, therefore a vibration. There are many other causes. For example, we have karmic contracts. We have karmic curses. We have collective intentionality and therefore con collective manifestation. We have a soul purpose. We have a life purpose. We have soul contracts. We incarnate not in a vacuum, we have soul groups, soul families, and we decide to take different roles in people's lives in our soul family to support them to learn different lessons. We've incarnated with an intention of what lessons we want to learn in these lifetimes. We've scheduled certain events to take place that we cannot avoid, and they're fated to happen. Of course, there's always free will because we can choose something before our birth. We have a pre-birth plan, essentially, to manifest something, but we also have the free will to ignore that if we, we so choose to. But there's strong desire to follow those lessons because we've scheduled them so that we can grow. So if we choose desires that are contrasting to our life purpose, our soul contracts, our collective intentionality as well, then it's not going to be so easy manifesting those desires. And that's why what my perspective about manifestation is right now is let's find out first what our life purpose is. Let's be aware of what we came here to do and what our intentions were before we were born so that we choose desires aligned to that. Maybe going to the Caribbean is not meant for me at this point in life. And maybe I can manifest it at a later point because pre-birth, I arranged to go through a certain lesson or to manifest something different at this point in my life. How do you discover your life's purpose? Yes. So in the book, I have like a five-step process. And I start this process in, in an unexpected way. So the traditional manifestation process taught by the book and the movie The Secret is ask, believe, receive. So you ask for something, you believe it, and then you receive it. The universe delivers. I start the other way around in the sense we start with the first step, which is all about raising your vibration. That has to do with aligning yourself with your tr true nature, authentic self. Because unless you align yourself with your authentic self, and therefore your highest vibration, then you cannot truly know what your life purpose is, and you cannot truly know what desire to choose. So why would you ask before 
aligning yourself with who you are. Now, what does that mean? What does this alignment mean? At our very core, we know what a life purpose is. We're born knowing. And then life happens. Our parents happen. The school system happens. <laughs> People in our life happens that try to tell us, this is who you're supposed to be. This is the path you should follow. But when we go all the way back to our childhood and we remember what our interests were, what our hobbies were, what we what truly excited us, all these hold crew clues as to what a life purpose is. So with step number one, raising your vibration, it's all about remembering, re-membering, getting all the members of who you are together, essentially. And therefore, so you, you can remember who you truly are. And there are simple practices that we can use to raise our vibration, but I'm mostly talking about how to arrange our lifestyle in a way that supports our vibration. How do we ad ad adjust our relationships, the energy of our house, the energy of, uh, of, of what we eat, how we exercise. All of these factors are influencing our connection to our authentic nature cleansing our energy so that we don't allow other people's thoughts and beliefs to be our own and really reconnecting with our soul. When we do that through different practices, such as what I've just mentioned, we start remembering who we truly are and our life purpose comes online. And of course, I have a very step-by-step -step method to finding your life purpose, but it starts with that, remembering what you love to do as a kid. And then getting all those breadcrumbs and putting them together and connecting them with okay, what was the happiest time of my life? And what, what brings me happiness? What brings me joy in my life? And how do I bring it all together to realize, oh, that is my life purpose. While listening to you, somebody may think that you may not be able to manifest everything you desire. Is that really true? Or is that possibly a limiting belief and we still can manifest all our desires? A claim I make in the book is that you cannot manifest all of your desires, which I know many people will not believe that and will be upset by that. I used to believe you can manifest anything you want, but I cannot manifest flying. I cannot manifest changing the hair of my color at will. I cannot manifest changing the hair of my eyes at will because there are universal laws that we cannot go against. There are biological laws, there are laws of physics, that we cannot go against. And those laws have existed and they exist for a reason. And when we go back to the ancient Greeks, for example, we have a concept of imarmeni, which is basically the ancient Greek concept of fate, saying that there is a, a, an order in the universe that, cannot, uh, that we cannot overcome, that we cannot go against. Certain things are meant to take place. And that is essentially how the, the laws of the universe around the universe. So from this perspective, you cannot manifest everything you want. We cannot manifest everything we want. We can manifest most things that are possible and within those universal laws. And the closer those things are to our life purpose, the easier it will be for us to manifest certain things. Yes, I can choose a desire that's so opposite to what my life purpose is. And with enough focus and attention and action, I can manifest that. But is it really worth it? And do we really want to take ourselves through all this struggle what, where we can choose desires that we truly want and that are truly aligned with our life purpose that will not just allow us to experience fulfillment and joy here on earth, but will also allow us to keep on evolving in the lifetimes afterwards? I think that's way more appealing. Are there any other myths about manifestation? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for asking this question. I'm passionate about this. And one of them is that negative thoughts and emotions go against manifestation. No, they don't. They, we have negative thoughts and emotions because we're human. If we were not meant to have negative thoughts and emotions and beliefs, we would not have been born. We would have stayed in spirit and experienced pure love and happiness 24-7. But from the moment we decided to incarnate into these physical bodies, we accepted duality and we accepted that there is contrast in the world and contrast allows us to grow. And contrast can come in the form of negative thoughts, negative emotions, and negative beliefs. Many manifestation teachers and books teach, like ignore 
the negative and just focus on the positive. From my experience, that leads to toxic positivity, which leads to, which leads to spiritual bypassing. I'm not going to deal with that trauma <laughs> that really shaped my perspective about the world and life. And I'm just going to focus obsessively on manifesting a cruise in the Mediterranean or in the Caribbean. The trauma and the belief and the negative emotions won't go away if you ignore them. They're still going to be part of your psyche. They're already there, whether you ignore them or face them or not. And they're just running the show under the surface. So instead of ignoring our negative thoughts and emotions, why don't we bring them to the table? Why don't we have a conversation with them? Why don't we acknowledge them and instead transmute them? So in step number three of my process, it's called release your limiting beliefs. And essentially, I teach cognitive and energetic practices to transmuting and clearing our limiting beliefs, not ignoring them. And early on, I was really, um, I, I felt the importance of educating myself with cognitive tools, not just energetic. So I have a bachelor, sorry, a master's in, in psychology and I trained in trauma therapy and I, and I do a lot of cognitive work as well. And I brought one of those tools into this book. It's called Integral Eye Movement Therapy and I actually took permission from the creator to include it. It's very similar to EMDR. Many people are familiar with EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprogramming, or reprocessing, I think it's reprogramming. And it's basically a tool used by psychotherapists to treat PTSD, one of the most effective tools. IEMT, which is Integral Eye Movement Therapy, is similar to that one and has to do with helping us shift our identity. When we say a phrase like, I'm not good enough, and we have a pronoun such as I, whenever we have pronouns such as I, me, myself, that means we've learned to identify as someone who's not good enough. And when you learn something, you can also unlearn it. So in this process, we identify the memories and the experiences in our lives that created those identity imprints, those beliefs. And then we use eye movements to essentially deprogram our mind. Of course, there are many tools we can use. Many people use journaling exercises, EFT tapping, or traditional therapy. So many tools you can use out there. I just wanted to bring in something new. There are two things that you spoke of that I'd like you to dig a little deeper into, and that is, or they are, what is toxic positivity and what are karmic curses? Ooh, juicy questions, Jeff. Thank you. So toxic positivity is when we're trying to be positive when we're not really feeling positive. That means something happened at work and I'm upset. But it's my belief that if I let those negative emotions take over, that I'm going to lower my vibrational frequency, and therefore I'm not going to be able to manifest that cruise in the, major, in the, in the Caribbean. <laughs> so instead, what I'll do is, no, 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 nothing happened. All is well. All is well. I'm safe. I am happy. I am joyful. All is well in my world. And you know that underneath the surface, you're burning. <laughs> you just want to like lash out and vent about that person that gossiped about you, that attacked you, whatever happened at work. But no, 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 no. I am calm. All is well. I'm love and light. I'm sending them love and light. No, you're not. <laughs> A part of you is hating them and sending them juggers. Okay, but you're sending them love and light and you're breathing deeply, and you're writing down your positive affirmations, all is well in my world. I am peaceful at work. That is toxic positivity. <laughs> so what's really the best way to deal with that? Let yourself vent, lush out, get it out of your system. And then once you've expressed that, then you can make the shift into, okay, let's identify here. Why have I been triggered here? What is a deeper emotion here? What is the limiting belief that I may have here? Is it all them or could it be me as well? Is there a lesson here for me? Let me do some journaling about it. Let me identify that emotion. Have I felt that emotion before? When? Oh, I was 10 years old when that emotion happened. Why? Because my dad did something similar that triggered me. Hmm. Maybe this has to do with my dad 
triggering me in childhood. Hmm, let me do some eye movement therapy on that. This is how you actually do the work. This is how you don't spiritually bypass. This is how you're not positively toxic or toxically positive. So that's when it comes to toxic positivity. Let's talk about karmic curses. Karmic curses is a term that I used in my other book, Protect Your Light, which is all about energetic protection. And it's basically psychic attack that spans lifetime. Psychic attack is when someone sends an intense wave of negativity towards you, usually anger or jealousy, and or curses you, like ill wish, the evil eye, as we say in the Mediterranean. And you see the evil eye since the ancient times. There are ancient Greek vases that have the blue eye, the emoji there with the blue eye, that is a symbol of the evil eye. And you have it in ancient Greek vases. That's because people believed in that ill wishing since the ancient times, because it's true. Whenever we, we feel anger or feel jealousy, we send that energy to the, to, towards the other person. I call this psychic attack. A karmic curse is psychic attack that spans lifetime. It's someone ill wished you something in a past life, and that did not get cleared in the in-between the lifetime state, and you carry that curse in your current lifetime. And therefore, it's blocking your manifestation. So you can do energetic healing to clear and release that. Do you feel that you are a master of manifesting? And if so, can you share with us some of your own personal successes? I don't think anybody's a master <laughs> of anything. I think we're all in a never-ending journey of learning. I'm doing my fifth degree right now because I'm, I, feel, I, I never feel like I've learned enough. I'm like, okay, what more can I learn? But I feel that I've experimented with different manifestation practices for many years, and I've come up with a process that works for me, that works for my client, and hopefully I think will work for other people as well. I want to share the story of how I manifested this book, Ancient Manifestation Secrets, because it was with the process that I used in the book, very meta, how I did that. So I wrote that book in 2021, and it's only coming out now, 2024, because I actually went to Delphi in Greece and I channeled the practices in the book there. Part of the book is researched, it's the seven laws of the universe, but then I teach a brand new way of manifesting with the energy field by planting the desires in our energy field, nurturing those desires, and then manifesting energetically. So that is a later part of the book. But I was in Delphi, I channeled the practices, and then I'm so excited, I finished writing the book, I go to my publisher at the time and I'm like, this is, this is my, my next book. And they rejected it, saying it's too advanced. You're challenging too many things. People are not ready for this. Why don't you write a book about the Greek gods and goddesses instead? So I went ahead and I wrote my book, Secrets of Greek Mysticism, which was all about working with the Greek gods and goddesses. But I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to let a publisher dictate when I'm going to publish this book. I'm going to find another publisher. I like that uh, Quote by Chris Jenner, uh, if someone says no, you're talking to the wrong person. It's my life motto. Okay. Hey, Chris Jenner for the win. So I'm like, no means they are the wrong publisher for me. I'm going to find another publisher. So I ended up finding the other publisher. But how? I planted the desire to manifest that book because that's the process that I use. I planted that desire in my energy field. Our desires are like orbs of light and they linger around the universe searching for the right host. Once they find the right host, they make contact. If the host sees them, takes them, nurtures them, they stay. If not, they move on to another host. That desire came to me. I'm like, this book has to be manifested by me, not by somebody else. So I took that orb of light, planted it in my energy field, nurtured it with my own energy, connected it with energy cords to spiritual beings to companies, to people, cooperative components that could come in and support its manifestation. And then I kept started pitching to different publishers. And with this specific publisher that I ended up with, eventually, the editor, we kept missing each other's emails. She was interested in the book, but we couldn't arrange a time to like talk. And this was going on for like six months. And then one day I was meditating and I get a hit in my meditation, email her right now. So like, a, I was like guided, like a zombie. I come out of the meditation. I go to my email. I, I sent her an email. Within five minutes, she replies. She's like, let's jump on a Zoom call now. Within 10 minutes, we jumped on a Zoom call. 
I talked to, talked to her about the book. She liked the book. Within the next hour, she sent me the contract. Because I had planted that desire, I nurtured that desire, I connected that desire to this publisher and other different cooperative components, I was high in my vibrational frequency. And then when the divine guidance came in my meditation, email her right now, I listened to it and I took the action. And here we are with this book. I've been dabbling in manifestation for quite a while, and just the fact that we're here together is to me a, a validation of it. But sometimes I feel if I start not focusing on manifesting, or I just no, don't pay attention, attention to what I'm doing, I can start manifesting bad things happening in my life as well. Does that sound possible to you? Of course, because... We have intention. Let's go back to the first law, the law of mentalism. Whatever it is we manifest, it starts with an intention, a mental intention. And the Kibalion talks about the process of outpouring, which, is, which has to do with how any creators create by outpouring energy into something. It starts with an intention, a mental image. I want to manifest something specific, and then you pour energy towards that. If we don't pour energy, we're going to get a, a mixed bag of things. We're going to learn, let the world, our parents, the school system tell us, this is what you should experience. So we're just subject to what people are thinking, what people are, are telling us. We're not masters of our own vibrational frequency and not masters of our purpose, essentially. And I want to share an example that really, a metaphor, essentially, that, that really communicates this. Think of how actors get into character. I'm an actor as well. So I, I use this process in my acting is you have this idea of, okay, this is a character I want to do Hamlet, for example. You don't just get on stage and pretend to know how Hamlet acts. You do your research. You read the text, but you read about the history and the context and where was Hamlet and what was his, his background and what shaped the way he thinks about the world. You start to spend hours and hours thinking about, okay, how would Amlet think and how would he move? What is the kinesiology like? How, how is he thinking? How is he expressing? What is the quality of his voice and his movements? You outpour so much energy into that. So you get on stage and you are Amlet for the duration. And then you get off stage and you're yourself as an actor. So you have a creation that's very real that to the audience seems all oh my God, he is that person. And you experience the emotion that that, that that character is feeling. And then you get on stage and you're not that anymore. I think that that is manifestation at its finest. And you can see that with authors writing books and creating different characters, the characters exist in that book. And the author becomes those characters that he's writing for the duration of writing because he's outpouring their energy into their creation. But then also... He's his own or she's or they are their own people, not just their character. So do you see what I'm talking about here? It's a co-creation. Manifestation is universal collaboration. It's the universe is not our. It's not all about, oh, universe, this is what I want. Give it to me. No, 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 no. We have to collaborate to bring our desires into manifestation. Are there certain limiting beliefs that many people have? that you see over and over again? Yes. Number one is I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to succeed. I'm not worthy to fulfill my dreams. Or I'm not good enough. Or I'm not ready yet. Ooh, light workers, spiritual people in general love using that. I'm not ready yet. Uh, or um, my family will reject me. My friends will leave me. Because we have a, a bit karmic contracts, not karmic, karmic trauma in this case. We have past life trauma, the witch wound. Many spiritual people suffer from the witch wound. The idea that we've been persecuted in a past life for expressing our magic and for saying something um, true that goes against the status quo, for example. I'm like, what if I get persecuted again? So this is something that's shared within most of the spiritual community, but everybody deals with, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough and I'm not uh, ready enough to do something. And again, it has to do with the split that we experience as soon as we, we incarnate into this world. 
where we go from being these beautiful, perfect, all loving, pure spiritual beings. And then suddenly we have a physical body and we have a limitation. We have like an ego. Immediately that creates a separation from source. And when we believe that separation from source for a long period of time, we start believing that that's, that's all we are. That's why we need our spiritual practice to remind ourselves that, yes, we are this physical body, but we are also more than that. And that bigger aspects of us comes in to tell us you are worthy. You are ready enough. You are good enough. If somebody wants to find out about your new book, should they go to Amazon or your website? Amazon is the easiest way to go. However, when you go to ancientmanifestationsecrets.com, which is a dedicated page for the book, I have a list of all the retailers. I mean, it's available everywhere. Books are sold, but I have uh, like the, the main retailers selling it. And when you get the book, you can also get a free workshop with me. It's a past life regression to retrieve manifestation skills from your past lives because we've lived past lives where we were master manifestors. So in that regression, I take people back to their past lives and retrieve those skills in these lifetimes. And it's available for free to anybody who uh, who gets the book. And all the details are in ancientmanifestationsecrets.com. How does the regression work? Is it like a meditation or what? Yeah, it's a one hour hypnosis regression. So one of the things I do is I'm, I mean, I'm a regressionist. I'm a past life regressionist. So I take people to their past lives, not as a form of, of spiritual entertainment, but to heal traumas, to retrieve skills, to find out what my life purpose was, what my soul family is, for example. And therefore, I'm using this technique that I've, uh, that I've developed to uh, essentially create a transmission of skills, wisdom, and talents that we've mastered in our, in our past lives into our present lifetime. And this is based on the idea that we're not just our limited present life selves, we are our eternal self. And when we step into the identity of our eternal self, our soul, all the gifts and the talents and the wisdom we've amassed through our many lifetimes become available for us to use right now. What if somebody's really busy in their life? Are there any techniques or steps that they can do to still be able to manifest things? Yes. Oh, okay. I love teaching like manifestation, to, uh, like tips and, and tools for busy people. My favorite one, because I mean, let's face it, life is busy. We have so many things that come to us at all times, so many ways to, to be interconnected with everybody. So we, we need to learn how to manifest on the go. My favorite tool that I teach in the book as well, I call them gratitude touchstones. These are short periods of time during the day where we practice gratitude. And gratitude is a beautiful emotion because it's a transmuting emotion. It allows you to transmute something negative into something positive, but also take, take something positive and amplify it. And I do, I do this practice three times per day, in the morning, in the middle of the day, and at the end of the day, where I send a voice message to three best friends that I have. You can send them to one person. And if you don't want to send them to someone, you can send a voice message to yourself self, but it's important that you speak this out loud, okay, to like give it more power. So I send a voice message to my best friend in the morning, and I say what I'm grateful for in general, anything that comes up. And that, again, gets your day started in a, in a, in a positive mood. And you can do this while you're like putting on your facial creams or while you're getting ready. You can have your phone and you can just say, I'm grateful about this. I'm grateful about that. When you're walking the dog, for example, it doesn't take a long time, three to five minutes. Middle of the day, you say, I sent another voice message to another best friend. Yes, I got all my friends to do this. <laughs> I, I sold them this idea, this practice, and they love it now. And I say what I'm grateful for so far in the day. This also gives me the opportunity, if something went wrong, to transmute it. Let's say, for example, I missed a deadline. I'm like, oh, even though I missed this deadline, I'm grateful that I had a longer lunch break <laughs> because I truly needed it, for example. So it gives you the opportunity to transmute whatever happened. But also if something positive happened, and you're like, I'm grateful that I had a wonderful chat with this colleague, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end of the day, I send another voice message to another best friend. And I say what I'm grateful for, for the entire day. So it's a beautiful way to acknowledge what happened in the day, transmute 
smooth anything that didn't go as you planned, and also end the day in a positive way, in a high vibrational state, so that you can sleep peacefully and wake up in the morning feeling better as well. Do you think that when people manifest things, or at least they're trying to, that they need to realize that even though you put the intention out today, it may not come for a week or two. You know, there has to be a little bit of time before it happens. Yes, sometimes a lot of time. Because the law of cause and effect teaches that there are many causes involved, a series of causes, a chain of causes involved for an effect and therefore for manifestation. So let's say, for example, you want to manifest something right now. It may take for many like synchronicities and people to come together and companies and spirit guides to support and uh, strings to pull and you having certain experiences and people rearranging themselves in a, in a different way for you to be able to manifest something specific. That's why it took me like four years to manifest this book. Things had to happen in between little known causes that were I was not aware of that I now know exactly what they were of because I can see them for this book to manifest. For example, the reason this book ended up manifesting after my book about the Greek gods and goddesses is because my audience had to know about my perspective about the ancient Greeks before they were ready to understand the ancient manifestation secrets book that is about the Greeks as well. So if I didn't give them a basis in that previous book, they wouldn't understand this one. I didn't know that four years ago. So that's why that desire did not manifest then. I could have easily said, it's not meant to happen. I'm not a good manifester. I'm going to give up on that desire. But no, because we're not gods. We don't know everything. There are things that we can't know. So we have to trust that it's all going to work out. And like something that I like to like say, to just allow myself to surrender more deeply to this understanding is, I want to manifest this or something better. Or I want to manifest this if it's for my highest good. And that releases that desire because you may think you want something, but you may not really truly want something, that specific thing. So when you release it by saying this or something better, or if it's for my highest good, then you allow your soul to come in and say, you know what? This is for your highest good or this isn't and that thing is. And therefore, it allows you to receive the desires that are truly in alignment with your purpose. This question may be a little bit out there, but I'm still going to ask it. Since you're into ancient Greek mythology and the goddesses and gods, do you think that those goddesses and gods were actually extraterrestrials? I, I love out there questions. <laughs> Let, let's, let's go there. So there's a difference between mythology and theology. So mythology draws from theology, but theology does not draw from mythology. So in the myths, we see gods and goddesses with human traits and characteristics. They fight, they feel resentment, they, they engage in like human-like acts. This is not who the gods are. These are ways that we've created stories to teach allegorical deep spiritual understanding and meanings of the gods and goddesses. For example, we have Aphrodite being jealous and being this, um, um, this, this, this human-like goddess essentially that sleeps with different gods and men, etc. That truly, when you interpret it, means that Aphrodite and who she is, she's a universal law of form she creates, she's sacred sex, she's the energy of creation, Eros, for example, She's present in ev everywhere in life. So when you have bees pollinating flowers, when you have humans having sex, when you have waves crashing on the beach, you have the creation of something new, new life, new emotions, new experiences. That is the energy of Aphrodite. The gods and goddesses, they're not just energies. They're not just archetypes. They're not just spirit guides. They are universal laws. They don't represent universal laws. They are the universal laws that we've just portrayed in physical ways so we can relate to them. Now, this is what the ancient Greek religion teaches. There are also philosophical schools, the Orphic, the Platonic, the Aristotelian, the Stoic philosophical schools that were concerned with what happens after death and what happened before birth. These philosophical schools 
have different understandings and explanation as to where the gods and goddesses came from and what they are. Okay. So, but the main line of the religion believes what I've just told you. The Orphic philosophical school, which is a philosophical school I'm part of as well, believes that the gods and goddesses used to be humans that evolved into gods and goddesses. It's the idea of evolution that we see that we know, okay, the, the evolution of the world and the species, but there's also the evolution of souls. And all souls start from manifesting and incarnating as atoms, as minerals, as plants. They eventually ascend to manifesting and incarnating as uh, animals. And then eventually they incarnate as humans who are more developed and therefore they can develop consciousness. And then from humans, they ascend to being heroes. Heroes is a type of deity, for example, that's above human but below God. Okay. Then they evolve to being daemons, not the Christian demon, which is an appropriation of the ancient Greek daemon. Daemons are like lower level gods and goddesses. And then from daemons, the soul ascends to being a god or a goddess. And the gods of Olympus, for example, Aphrodite, Zeus, Hera, etc., they are the most ascended souls. So by the ancient, by the Orphics, the gods used to be humans, not extraterrestrials. But that also explains Atlantis, for example, and Lemuria. That they were, there, there's a theory that the Greek gods and goddesses were priestesses in Atlantis, for example. That checks with this, <laughs> with this theory, even though the ancient Greeks haven't talked about that. Plato talked about um, Atlantis falling and the fall of Atlantis. Um, but that idea checks with, with this theory as well. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Oh, yes. Yes, please. You can message me. You can DM me on Instagram. That's where I live. So if you go to George Lizos on Instagram, send me a DM. I always reply voice messages usually. I love connecting with people. Besides this new book, do you have anything else that you're working on that you want people to know about? I mean, since we talked about the Greek gods and goddesses, for those people who are interested, not in Greek mythology necessarily, but Greek theology and the connections between the two, my book, Secrets of Greek Mysticism, it also came out this year. It's, this is my, uh, I have two books coming out this year. This came out in April, and now we have the Ancient Manifestation Secrets. And I think of them as like sequels because they're interconnected. Ancient Manifestation Secrets focuses on the Hermetics, which is a different philosophical school, whereas Secrets of Greek Mysticism talks about the ancient religion as a whole. Well, before we wrap it up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yes. This is a tool that I teach that is like the fastest tool to really connect to your authentic self and therefore to your purpose, who you truly are, and therefore to the desires that are truly in alignment with who we really are. And several times throughout the day, I like to stop, pause, place a hand on my heart and just say, wake up. And the intention behind saying wake up is wake up to your inner divinity, wake up to your purpose, wake up to who you truly are. Remember that you're not just a physical body, that you're beyond that. Remember that you have a purpose that you came here to fulfill. Remember that in this moment, you're aligning to this purpose. It's a simple intention. Wake up to wake up your true essence. And when you do that, and you feel that, and you feel that connectedness, you no longer ask, what is my life purpose? And what desires should I manifest? You already know, and you're already following them. George, thank you for your message, and thank you for being my guest. Jeff, thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.